Oh God, help us to listen to your word with understanding, to receive it with faith, and to obey it with courage, for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. Please be I'm sure that most of us have already discovered that life is a learning process. Now, as we go through life, we learn in different ways. Have you ever heard the expression, older and wiser? Do we all feel like we're becoming that, older and wiser? Mm -hmm. There are at least three different ways of learning. One is formal education. When we go to school, we sit in a classroom and we learn, and we receive certificates and diplomas and degrees to show the level of education that we have achieved. And of course, we come to church on Sunday and we sit and we listen to a formal sermon. So that's one way, formal education. And number two, we learn in casual ways. You know, we watch what others are doing, we listen to what they're saying, and we learn from them. We learn what to do and what not to do sometimes. And number three, we learn in practical ways, by doing things ourselves. You know, if you want to play hockey, you have to get out on the ice and play hockey, go and do it. If you want to learn to drive a car, you have to get in the car and drive it. You have to do it in order to learn it. So we learn in practical ways. And so wisdom comes from life experience. My grandfather, my mother's father, did not have much formal education. He left school after grade two to help his father provide for the family. And he learned to read by reading his Bible. And he spent his livelihood as a fisherman during fishing fishing season and as a woodsman during the winter months. And he and my grandmother had a farm and they raised animals and vegetables to provide for their family of five children. They had a little formal education, but they worked hard and they learned many skills throughout their life. And they were loving, caring people. In the Gospels, we read how Jesus teaches his disciples. And the twelve disciples learn by listening to Jesus' sermons, watching him interact with others, healing and performing miracles. And then he sent the twelve out to do the same, and they learned by doing. And in today's Gospel passage, he sends out seventy more. And he gives them a wonderful lecture in how to do missionary work before they go. And there are three outstanding features in Jesus' lecture. First, there is a large harvest. And secondly, there are few workers. And thirdly, there are many dangers. And if you're going to go out for Jesus, remember those three facts. There's a large harvest, and you must expect to be successful. And there are few workers, and so you must pray for more. And there are many perils, and you've got to be on your guard. Watch for the trouble. Jesus said, I send you out like, lamb, like a lamb among wolves. Have you ever felt like that? That you're a lamb among a bunch of wolves? Mm -hmm. That's what a Christian is. An innocent creature going out among wolves. It isn't easy to be a Christian in today's world. Have you felt that? In fact, it has never been easy. And we have to be on our guard. The harvest is plentiful, even today. Now, Woodstock has a population of 5,200 people. About 1,000 attend church on a Sunday. And so there are some 4,000 people who are on church right here in our community. Our mission field is here. 
Now, I used to think that the harvest is plentiful meant that the mission field is large. But Jesus didn't say the field is large. He said what is large? The harvest. The harvest is large. And so this should send us out feeling optimistic and thinking, I'm going to bring some back. I'm going to get a large harvest. No, not, well, I wonder if I'll get anybody. You know, the harvest is plentiful is a statement of hope. It's a statement that we're going to go out and get people for Christ. Did you know that in the last 2,000 years of the history of the church, that there have been billions of Christians? Billions. According to a 2011 Pew Research Center survey, there were 2.19 billion Christians around the world in the year 2010. So, nine years ago, there were 2.19 billion Christians around the world. Get your head around that figure. Over 2 billion. That's a lot of Christians, isn't it? And that's more than three times the number of Christians that were reported in 100 years earlier. In, in the year 1910, none of us were alive in the year 1910, were we? In that year, there were 600 million Christians in the world. And according to another study, it says by the year 2050, the Christian population is expected to be 3 billion. Did you know that the Christian church is growing? Sometimes it doesn't feel that way right here. But the Christian church is growing by leaps and bounds in places like China and Africa. And it's actually declining in North America. But there is a large harvest. And we mustn't go out pessimistic thinking, well, there's hardly anybody we can win for Christ. Let's think big. The harvest is big. We're told that in Scripture, and God's Word is true. And there are hundreds of people out there just waiting for us to pick them. You know, they are ripe for the picking. People are hungry and they're searching and they don't know where to turn. And it's up to us to go and lead them to Christ. My friends, the harvest is there, but the laborers are few. And even so, if you only have a few laborers, you should send them out two by two. I think that's an important lesson for us to learn in this passage, that Jesus didn't send people out alone. He sent out the 70, two by two. He sent them out in couples and pairs. Maybe that's why so many of us fail to do much reaping. It's because we try to do it by ourselves. And I have experienced that in my ministry. You know, it's hard to be a priest on your own. And since Armin and I met, and we've been married now almost four years, God, I believe God is able to use me in a greater way. We are much more effective together than we are on our own. And there are many examples of that right here. And now Harold is curate, and ministry is much more effective in a parish with a second priest. And we have six lay readers. It's more, much more easy for the lay readers to do their role because there are six of them as opposed to only having one. The burden is sheared. And there's a reason that there are quilting guilds. We have a lot of quilters in our congregation because you accomplish so much more together than you do if you're just one quilter on your own, right? Jesus sent his disciples out in peers. And here's a serious suggestion. I'm going to ask every person here to consider and pray about inviting someone to be your partner in ministry. Will you ask someone, will you be my two? Let's pray together and work together to win someone for Christ. The husbands and wives are already at an advantage because we can do this together. But single people can work together and pray together to have an effective ministry for Jesus and for his church. Now we tend to try to do things on our own. 
many missionaries, many clergy are out there working on their own. But God wants us to work in twos, at least, teamwork, to share together. When Paul was called to be a missionary, God sent Barnabas with him, and then later Titus, or Timothy, or John Mark. But there was always two of them. Notice that as you read his letters. He sends readings on behalf of him and others. He didn't work alone. Jesus sends out the 70 in twos. There were 35 peers that were sent out, but that's still not enough. And he says, I need more. And we are to pray for more missionaries. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Just think, Jesus must be looking down on Woodstock now and saying, I need more. There are 5,200 people right here in Woodstock. And there are some 35,000 people who come to Woodstock for shopping and entertainment and other things. The harvest is huge. I need more, but I need twos who will do it together. I'm asking you to think about that. We go out as lambs among wolves. Christians will always be persecuted. It's tough going out into the world. Have you experienced that? And so Jesus told the 70 to travel light, not even a spare pair of shoes. Just go out light, travel light when you go out there. But they are not only to travel light, but they are to be sparing in their use of time and to not pass the time of day with people. He says, greet no one on the road. Don't dilly-dally when you're doing the Lord's work. Now I confess that I sometimes procrastinate, especially when I have things on my mind or I see things that need to be done. And I will go and I'll do those trivial things first before I get around to doing the important thing that really should be the priority. And now Jesus didn't mean that you shouldn't say good morning to someone that you meet on the road. But he meant, don't stop and make idle chatter. Don't gossip. Don't pass the time of day with them. Get on about the Lord's work. How much time we waste passing the time of day with people. This idle chatter, gossip. We are to focus on getting the Lord's work done. It is interesting what Jesus says about where we get our support in doing the Lord's work. You see, we get our support from the people that we are sent to help. And this is the principle, which is in 1 Corinthians 9.14, which says, Those who live for the gospel should live by the gospel. You should take your support from those you, you are sent to help, so that you are in a two-way relationship. You are given the spiritual help, and they are giving you material support. And just as Jesus with the woman at the well in Samaria began the conversation, do you remember how he began the conversation? He asked her a question. Can you remember what that was? Give me some water. Yes. Would you give me something to drink, please? Pretty simple way of starting a conversation, isn't it? Would you give me something to drink, please? Would you give me a glass of water, a drink of water? And he gave her the truth. See, that's the basic principle of missionary work. Perhaps better work would be done on the mission field if missionaries lived by this very simple principle so that folks they are trying to help would feel that they are helping the missionaries. This was Jesus' principle. When you get into a town, eat what is set before you. Let people feed you. Let them support you. You do everything you can for them, and let them do everything they can for you. It's an extraordinary fact that when you receive support from another person, they are open to receiving from you. I repent of all the times that I have said no thank you when someone has offered something to eat or drink. 
You know, I, and I did that as recently as this week. Now, as, as I was preparing this sermon, reading and reflecting on this message, Jesus' teaching opened my eyes, and I realized that by saying no thank you, I was rejecting someone's hospitality. And that is wrong. To say, please give me a drink of water, is to open a person's heart so that they can feel that they can give something to you. And I remember when I was in Guatemala, I was in that exact same situation, and I was thirsty. And of course, the people in Guatemala speak Spanish, which I don't speak. And uh, so I wanted a drink, and I was playing with these little children. We were at a house built. We were building houses for, for people there. And so we were on the site, and the family was all around as we were building this house. And I was playing, my job was to play with the children, to entertain the children. And I was really thirsty, it was so, so hot. And I said, I need a drink. And I had my own water, so I went to get my own water. But the children understood what I wanted. And so they went and they asked their mom if I could have a drink. And so when I came back to where they were, here was the mom standing holding a glass of water for me. And I should have taken the water, but really I said, no, thank you, I have my own water. And so I repent of all those times that I have said no, when I really should have accepted another person's hospitality. Please give me a drink of water is to open a person's heart so that they feel that they can give something to you. So it's a two-way relationship. And it isn't rocket science, is it, folks? But sometimes it takes us a while to learn the simplest things. And do you see that, that, how that affects your ministry? When we go out and say, no thank you, no thank you, I've had my cup of tea, I've had my lunch, I'm not hungry, no thank you. Now, I've come to tell you about Jesus. Do you see how saying no puts up a, a barrier to that relationship? And instead, we could say, oh, I've been walking up and down the street, knocking on doors. Oh, I'm so thirsty. You wouldn't give me a cup of tea, would you? People love offering hospitality. We're really good at that in this county. Do you see how important it is to accept it? It's a great equalizer. And this is the method that Jesus chose for his missionaries. Now let the people you are helping support you. Have a two-way relationship. Eat what is set before you and pray for them and say, the kingdom of God has come near you. And then Jesus points out that not everyone will accept the message. Whenever people hear the gospel, they will do one of two things. They have a choice. They will either accept it or reject it. And if, if they reject it, this is what Jesus says, if they reject it, as you leave their place, wipe the dust from your shoes in protest of them. That's Jesus' words, not mine. Jesus said that rejecting the gospel is far worse than moral degradation. He said it would be worse for them than Sodom and Gomorrah. And you know what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah? We tend to think that immorality is the worst sin, but it's not. Jesus said the worst sin is when people reject you because they're rejecting you, they're rejecting Jesus and God. And that's a choice that the individual makes. And their choice either brings them closer to heaven or closer to hell. As witnesses and ambassadors for Christ, our role is to alert people to what the kingdom of God looks like. The love of Christ compels us to go on preaching so that more and more will be drawn closer to him. The harvest is large, even though the workers are few. And as we think about those 70 who went out, they went out with fear, unsure of how effective they would be in their ministry. And then, at the end of, the, at, at the end of that passage, 
we are told they return with great joy because they had a fruitful ministry. They were excited. And the glory of it is that of all the things you hear in formal sermons and in formal Christian education, as important as those things might be, they do not bring the joy that comes when you actually go out there and try it and come back saying, it works, it works. I've tried it and I've seen how the power of Jesus can work in people's lives. That's the most glorious thing about ministry. And if all we do is listen to sermons and read books, as good as those things are, we're going to miss the joy of going out there and witnessing for Christ and seeing how people respond. See how the power of God shows up in conversations. Just this week, I have visited people and I have seen their faces light up with the love of Christ and heard them speak of hope despite their physical circumstances. And I walked away from those visits feeling blessed. Jesus gave a final warning to the 70. He said, it's wonderful what you have done. The enemy cannot defeat you when you are doing the Lord's work. But be careful. Don't get excited about the power. Don't be thrilled about what you have done with the power that I have given you. Be excited about what God has done. We are to be more thrilled about the grace of God than about the gifts of His Spirit. We are to be more thrilled that He has written our name up there than about anything that we can do down here in His name. Be thrilled that you are in the harvest. I want to leave you with just two questions. The first question is, are you a disciple of Jesus? And the second question is, if you are, are you getting a full education? Are you getting more than a formal sermon here every Sunday morning? Are you getting a casual education as you stand at your kitchen sink, or at work, or wherever you are? Are you getting a practical education by going out and doing what the 70 did, building two-way relationships with your neighbors, doing your part to draw them closer to God? Let us bow our heads in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, you seek disciples students of your word, whom you can train to be apostles, ones who are sent out into the world. We recognize that we cannot teach others what we haven't learned ourselves. Lord Jesus, help us to learn. Teach us in all these three ways how to follow you. We ask this for your name's sake. Amen.